Welcome to the Canadian AI Industry Track 2020. I'm David Nadeau, and it's an honor to host the Industry Track this year virtually. Uh, a quick intro about me. I'm the lead machine de learning developer at InnoData, a data engineering company uh, with presence in eight countries. I have a PhD in machine learning from the University of Ottawa and a master in natural language processing from l'Université Laval. I have 20 years of experience in the field, having done industrial research in text summarization and entity recognition in the early 2000s, doing R&D at the National Research Council around 2005, uh, running a startup in social media monitoring in 2010, being CEO of an uh, Ottawa-based media monitoring company uh, until 2015, and now working at positioning InnoData as a major player in the field of human expert augmentation using AI in the legal and financial domain. About the industry track, so we've received, there was a lot of interest in the track. We've received more than 15 uh, communication proposals and we've selected five participants based on the relevance of their topic, but also the diversity of uh, the topics. So I think today we're covering a lot of ground. It's going to be very interesting. We want to. Uh, show the state or talk about the state of the industry uh, around AI in Canada. Um, in the first part of this uh, track, we're going to have an open-ended discussion with all the participants about the profession of uh, data scientist and AI practitioner. Um, after that, I've grouped the presentation as follows. So we have five participants. Um, let me just go to this slide. So we'll start with marie -Ève. We'll use our, pre our presentation as our general introduction. She's presenting a clear and lucid process to bring AI to production in a very conservative domain uh, industry like banking. Um, she's going to talk about very important problems where AI can be applied today. We'll continue with two presentations uh, from two CTOs that we have uh, uh, in, in the track. So Isuru and Shazad are CTO, Chief Technology Officer of their respective company. Uh, what is fascinating here is that they draw a very similar picture of the state of the industry. They make it clear how hard it is to serve AI in practice, so to deliver, uh, you know, predictions and, and machine learning predictions in practice. And they give, they give uh, practical advices. You'll see a lot of commonalities between the two presentations, which hints that uh, they are talking about best practices. And then we'll have uh, two very practical and industry-specific uh, applications of AI with Nolan and uh, Tamil. Um, and for anyone thinking that we're just spinning our wheels in the domain, uh, you'll see how AI unlocks real value in real industries. So enough talking, let's put uh, the participants in the spotlight. And now let's uh, introduce our first two participants for the industrial track. I have with me Maria Malet and Shazad Khan. Um, I will start to uh, talk with uh, Madriev. She's an artificial intelligence scientist at the National Bank of Canada. Uh, she's working on digital transformation initiatives for the banking industry. Um, Madriev has expertise in machine learning and quantitative finance. She's affiliated with the uh, IVADO of the University of Montreal. Uh, she holds a master in financial engineering from the HEC Montreal and a master in artificial intelligence from the University of Montreal. The topic uh, of this industrial track, uh, one of the topic is uh, talking about the profession, talking about uh, what it is to be in the industry. Um, and I'd like to hear uh, from you, so what it is to work in AI at the National Bank. Yeah, so um, working as an AI scientist at National Bank is a, it's a very multifaceted role. Um, when we think of an AI scientist, usually we think, okay, so you train models, you do feature engineering, and that's it. But um, it's so much more than that. And actually, the modeling part um, is perhaps maybe like 
20% on a lucky day. Sometimes it's just 10% uh, of my time. So uh, the rest of our time is dedicated uh, to understanding the business needs um, across the bank, which is, you know, there's a lot of divisions inside a bank like National Bank of Canada. Um, understanding business needs, why? Because we want to uh, identify uh, opportunities for us to uh, implement AI and perhaps improve um, the service that we give to our clients. Um, also, another big part of our time is data acquisition, because uh, in a big institution like NBC, data is very scattered. Uh, and sometimes, you know, for your models, you might need data that has been collected manually. You might need data that is in the legacy system somewhere. You might need data from some team somewhere. So it's about gathering all of that so that you can do the modeling part. And then um, another important part is the deployment. So uh, making sure that you can monitor your models and that you can um, package them nicely into uh, an application that can be used by the person who's, who needs it. Great. And you're in the banking industry. So I'm wondering, is AI um, in use in many places? What's the status? Are we at the beginning of the adoption of AI? Um, the AI initiative at National Bank is very recent. Uh, the group started about two years ago, um, and I was there the year that it uh, it started. And just over two years, it has changed a lot. So I would say that we're still in the early stages. And to my knowledge, uh, our competitors like Desjardins, uh, RBC, they've started also, but everything is early stage. We have uh, also with us Shazad Khan. Um, Shazad is the CTO of Knowit Inc., uh, where he leads the artificial intelligence and machine learning practices. Uh, he has a PhD in computer science from the University of Cambridge, UK, and a master in information studies from Syracuse University. Um, Shazad holds five patents and is the author of more than 25 peer-reviewed academic publications. Uh, his research interests lie in uh, semantic analysis on big data using natural language processing and machine learning at scale. So welcome, Shazad. Um, so let's talk about your work as a, a CTO of a company in Ottawa. Thank you much, David, for having me on. Uh, so it's a little uh, unusual to be uh, essentially being um, someone who represents the startups because nowadays uh, ai is uh, typically something that you come across in big companies when they're trying to transform from the old world where they're doing everything by hand to automating things in a data-driven manner this has uh, really started uh, going mainstream in the past 10 years and didn't really exist um, as something in industry like 30 years ago um in our case, we actually started from the other end. We started from uh, the university research. My, my company started as uh, almost an uh, spin-off of uh, the, my PhD research at uh, Cambridge University. And over the years, um, instead of um, pursuing a traditional academic uh, career, which a lot of my colleagues did, um, I decided to go out into industry and commercialize um, my work. And I've been dealing with uh, a lot of the same challenges that uh, you have in terms of um, being able to get funding, in terms of like you know running a research agenda. But I also have a number of unique challenges that I've been addressing in terms of trying to hit product market fit, trying to make sure that we're building the right uh, solutions for our customers as opposed to running yet another science project. So it's been a very unique experience in, in that sense. Um, there is a lot of parallels uh, with uh, the work that is done by others um, or other AI projects. Uh, there is always the discovery phase where you're trying to figure out what is the problem you're trying to automate. There is the data gathering phase. Um, then you have the initial prototypes that have to be built in in-house. In um, a lot of times uh, these discussions are uh, clothed in um, business speak. So you talk about return on investment. Um, as opposed to hypothesis proving and so on. Um, then you end up like uh, having uh, the actual fun part where you're 
doing the feature engineering, the testing, the creating of the initial prototypes, proof of concepts. Um, at that point, it gets to a very interesting point where uh, the data scientist and the AI practitioners have actually created something that is useful. And in our experience, uh, there is a natural handoff to the, the DevOps and engineering side of the company. Um, I've learned uh, over the past um, probably 14 years in industry that uh, data scientists should not be the one that are managing uh, production uh, uh, projects, actually, because we tend to love to tweak. We tend to try and get that extra bit of like 0.1% accuracy, while when in production, what's more important is uh, that it's coming along, it's working, and it's serving the customers. It's a different set of problems that we are trying to solve. Yeah. So you've been uh, building a company from ground up uh, based on your research uh, in artificial intelligence uh, over the you know, last decade. Uh, so uh, what was the importance of your background in AI? I know you, you needed way more than AI. You needed you know, business skills and everything. But how do you put that in the balance? What was the importance of that uh, piece? So when choosing what to focus on for the company, I um, focused on my strengths and what I was good at. And I, I was an AI researcher. I still am an AI researcher. I'm still active. Uh, so that's where uh, the company's DNA is essentially patterned on aspirations that I had myself. Um, so that was the, the key um, uh, uh, motivator for um, ha having the, the company focus on uh, using semantic technologies, which is my area of research, to try and make sense of the vastness of the web and deliver real-time reports on, and background briefings on what's happening out there. Um, part of it also was that I had access to resources um, at the university. I had access uh, to uh, um, the, the ability to take raw developers and mentor them and um, essentially transform them into AI practitioners. So that was an advantage that uh, in, under my unique circumstances was available. Um, and that led to essentially us sticking very close to our knittings and focusing um, on uh, AI um, and building our entire solution around a number of uh, tasks and operations that we have automated. Um, essentially using machine learning, um, big data techniques, and so on, um, as opposed to traditional deterministic um, rule-based databases and programming, which you know you find in most other IT projects or IT startups. So I also have today with me uh, three participants, um, Tamid Mehdi, no Nolan Luncher, and Isu Gunasekara. Um, so starting with Tamid, uh, so Tamid is a machine learning researcher at uh, Geotech Scientific. He holds a master in computer science from the University of Toronto and a math degree from the University of Waterloo. Uh, Tamid has studied semi-supervised Bayesian models for computa computational biology and computer vision models for medical images. He's also, he has expertise in web statistics, database administration, and software applications for cancer research. Um, so, Tavid, what about your work? Um, how is it to, uh, to be in the industry? So, I'm a machine learning researcher at Geotech, and we make wireless uh, sensors for concrete that can measure properties of concrete. Um, the theme of the conference is uh, uh, a day in the life of an AI practitioner. But at a medium-sized company like Geotech, there really is no typical day. Every day is different. Um, we have lots of different projects going from uh, standard regression problems to uh, time series analysis. So we have to switch between projects pretty quickly and have a, a broad skill set. Um, our data science team is pretty small. We have four people, but we're quickly growing. And one of the challenges of having a small team is that every member um, is involved in every step of the data science pipeline, going from data processing and cleaning to hyperparameter tuning and eventually model deployment. So you have to be ready for 
uh, every step of the pipeline. Um, our data science team is a branch of R&D. So we're all about research. Uh, we like to read the latest machine learning papers, uh, try out new ideas, and uh, test them rigorously. And sometimes they really improve our product, and it's really exciting. Um, I think one of the challenges uh, being in the construction industry is that it generally takes a while to adopt uh, new technology. So we do a lot of proof of concepts with our customers. Uh, we work closely with them and uh, ask for their requirements and feedback whenever we're making new products. And it uh, really improves um, our products. And we've been really successful at uh, engaging them. That's pretty interesting. Um, you are you know, from an industrial uh, domain. So that's the industry track, but there's nothing uh, industry, uh, you know, specific like concrete testing. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and it, I think it, it's spectacular the fact that there is area for machine learning in a very specific domain like, like that one. Um, yeah, there's actually lots of problems um, in the concrete industry and the construction industry that AI can help. Um, some of the stuff we do, like uh, performance prediction of concrete or predicting when it's going to be poured. Those are some of the topics I'm going to talk about in my presentation. But there's also lots of other problems, like uh, how to optimize your schedule or how to use computer vision algorithms to reduce safety hazards on construction sites. So there's a wide variety of problems and lots of different models that we can apply for uh, to improve the construction industry. Great. So thank you, Tamid. Um, we also have uh, Nolan Luncher with us. He is a machine learning developer at Auto Motors, um, and he's developing perception system for self-driving industrial vehicles. Uh, Nolan graduated from the University of Waterloo with a degree in system design engineering. Uh, he then went on to complete his master in applied science as part of uh, a vision and image processing lab at the uh, University of Waterloo. And his graduate research focused on leveraging deep learning algorithms to develop low-cost 3D scanners. Um, so Nolan, uh, same type of uh, introduction discussion. So uh, how is it to, to, what's your typical day uh, at Auto Motors? Uh, yeah, so I work on the perception team here at Automotors, uh, which is a robotics company that develops self-driving industrial vehicles. Uh, the perception team that I'm a part of works on uh, basically any dealings with sensor inputs to the robot, uh, as well as building the representation of the surrounding environment. Um, so we work on all kinds of things from localization and, localization and mapping, object detection tracking, uh, 3D processing, computer vision, uh, as well as many more things. Um, we also work with uh, basically evaluating and selecting whatever the sensor suite is uh, that are going to be on our robots. Uh, Perception specifically is a part of the autonomy team, uh, which uh, works really closely with the navigation uh, side, uh, where they will deal with controlling the robot based on the information that we give them about the world. Uh, so for me, I've been with Automotors for about uh, just over two years now. Uh, my primary focus has been on developing the 3D pipeline, uh, as well as the machine learning efforts. Um, so since we're a relatively small company and an even smaller team within that, uh, pretty much all the developers um, work on their features through the entire development cycle, uh, all the way. Uh, so for me, specifically in the, in the machine learning side, that will include things like uh, all the literature review and the designing of the algorithms uh, through the data collection, uh, model training, uh, deployment, and uh, also tracking during deployment. Uh, so obviously, my day can include a lot of things, uh, like you would expect, a lot of coding and literature review, but also uh, playing with cameras and sensors uh, or driving robots. Very interesting. So you, you just said that you were touching pretty much all the um, important steps of uh, machine learning, you know, research, deployment, and, and everything. So uh, what, what would be the most important uh, stage, or maybe what would be the most interesting uh, stage in, in 
in this cycle? Uh, so a lot of it, I guess it's really interesting just uh, looking through whatever the works that are out there and looking at them from a perspective of what are the problems that we're specifically trying to solve and how are they going to apply to those. Um, and then also through the design process, especially the, the early like data collection and training, then we'll figure out kind of what were the real problems with these algorithms? Because not always uh, are those mentioned, like what the real nitty gritty issues with working with algorithms really are, um, as well as what the real failure modes are, with, uh, and also how they actually compare against other methods in you know, specific circumstances. Right. Thank you, Nolan. Uh, last but not least, we have uh, Isuru Gunaseka with us. He is uh, the Chief Technology Officer at the Immersive Data Labs in Ottawa. Um, it's an applied intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning company. Uh, Isuru's areas of expertise are natural language processing, real-time video and image processing, and efficient serverless implementation of machine learning systems. Um, Isuru has presented his work at several conferences, including EMNLP, BioNLP, and the Montreal AI Symposium. He holds a Master of Electrical and Computer Engineering degree at the University of Ottawa. Um, so in your uh, role of CTO at the Immersive Lab, um, so what are your responsibilities? What are, what are, what's your work looking like? Um, so it's mostly a man, uh, managing a machine learning, um, like a team of machine learning engineers. Uh, we have a team of six machine learning engineers and then um, three uh, engineers for backend, frontend, and uh, full stack uh, development. Um, and my work, uh, mostly involves uh, translating client uh, requirements into uh, things that we can actually develop uh, and apply machine learning algorithms into. Um, so on a, any given day, it would be from some, uh, it would range from something like uh, ex uh, managing the expectations of a client uh, to tell them uh, what can and cannot be done using a machine learning uh, model to uh, making sure that the team is uh, developing something that the uh, client can actually use and developing according to the client's requirements. So that's the usual day. Yeah, and, and you're putting the finger on something very important, managing the expectations of clients. Um, I, I, what would be the, the biggest misconception um, that you see in, in the uh, from your clients? I think like uh, one of the biggest misconceptions is uh, because there's a lot of hype around machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, there's a lot of uh, misconceptions thinking that uh, machine learning is a solved problem, and like it's it's. Uh, many people think it's like artificial general intelligence when in real life it's not. It's all about uh, what data sets you have, what kind of annotations you have, and uh, what the state of the art algorithms can do using those data sets. So bridging that gap and uh, like, uh, identifying what can be done to satisfy the client's needs uh, instead of telling them uh, that we can uh, develop artificial general intelligence to them is a big uh, challenge always. Um, so I'm going to talk today about uh, optimal and fluid mortgage rate approvals. This is just one of the projects that uh, we work on the AI team at National Bank. I'm going to touch on other projects that we do as well. Um, so just to paint the context a little bit, so the financial service um, industry is changing a lot um, and there's a lot of innovators and new technologies that are coming in the market and that can be um, disruptive to uh, the work that we do. So it's, uh, it's very natural um, for banks to build new capabilities and to want to innovate and accelerate their transformations. So that's the goal of the AI initiative, it's to accelerate um, 
the business strategy execution and uh, develop models and technologies that can compete with all those uh, fintech um, startups that are uh, putting out new uh, new technologies. So just to give you a couple of examples of some of the projects that we work on, we have, for example, uh, the credit card risk models. So there's quite a few models in this category. So just to give you one example, we have the credit card collection models. One of the things that we realized with uh, uh, credit card clients is that um, well, some of them end up not paying uh, or being late in their payments and sometimes defaulting. Um, but we also realized by looking at the data that uh, there were early signals that uh, a client might uh, not pay or be late or default. And so the goal of these models is to um, detect those signs as early as possible so that we can intervene um, and you know get in touch with the person um, see how we can we can help and work out this situation. Uh, so it's good for, for the bank because we we don't lose money, but it's also good for the client because they don't end up uh, with a bad uh, credit score. Um, another type of uh, models that we have are the dialogue systems. Um, for example, we have the chatbots. So uh, the chatbot works a little bit like, uh, you know, when you, you want to uh, call your you want to call your, your Fido, you want to call Fido or Video Tron. Um, I know personally I don't like to call, I'd rather just chat with the person. So the chatbot works a little bit the same way, but you're not talking to a human, you're talking to a machine. So you can ask questions and it's going to answer your question, hopefully. Um, so it's built so that uh, regardless of the way the question is uh, asked, it's going to understand your question and provide an answer. So chatbot is uh, is really cool because it allows us to also detect new, uh, perhaps new questions, uh, new needs that clients can have. And I think a really great example is what is happening right now with the pandemic. So uh, unfortunately, a lot of our clients have lost their jobs, um, so they need help with uh, paying their mortgage, uh, paying their credit cards or their loans, uh, so they're worried and it's uh, it's understandable. So we've been really quick at uh, reacting and uh, providing the chatbot with new answers to answer those questions. Um, another uh, project that we've been tackling since the fall, which is the name of my presentation, it's the uh, mortgage rate approval. So the way this works is that you, uh, let's say you want to buy a house and most likely you need a, you need a mortgage. Um, usually you're gonna go see your advisor in your branch and uh, this advisor has some authority to approve the, the rate that you want, but maybe you want a lower rate. Um, and so uh, what's gonna happen is your advisor is going to have to fill out a form that is going to be sent to a team of experts. So this team of expert is going to manually scan through uh, the form, analyze it, and then either authorize it or reject it. And if they reject it, then they will make a counter offer. Um, this team of expert, they receive close to 15,000, 20,000 requests on a yearly basis, which is massive. And so the goal of these models is to make the whole process faster and easier using uh, a series of uh, machine learning models. Um, I'm gonna skip the model validation uh, part. Maybe I'll come back to it later, but the model validation part is a, it's a new initiative and it's answering uh, some of the needs that we discovered that we have in the AI team. So you asked me earlier in the intro, uh, what is the role of an AI scientist at NBC? Um, and like I said, it's a very multifaceted, right? So we have, um, th this shows like in four categories, what our job is. And uh, the modeling part is where the AI comes in. So building and training and uh, evaluating our models, making sure that the performance is as high as possible. But um, one thing I forgot to mention is that the AI team inside NBC, um, is a, we work a little bit like uh, internal consultants. So uh, the projects can be in any line of business inside the bank. So it always starts with a business need. So there is a process that is too slow 
Uh, we know that we can improve the, the, the service to the client. Um, you know, maybe we want to reduce the costs. Um, I gave the example of the mortgage rates project that we have. So this is the kind of project that we're essentially building a decision-making helper to a team. So it starts with understanding the business needs and sometimes it's the team itself that is going to contact us and reach out and say, okay, we have this issue. Do you think uh, machine learning can help? And so we'll evaluate uh, and make a decision whether or not we we're going to take on the project. Um, I also mentioned that data acquisition is, um, is a big part uh, of our job because uh, inside a, an institution as complex and big um, as National Bank, the data is very scattered. Uh, it can be in different systems. It can be sometimes manually collected. Uh, and so, of course, you need to gather all this data so that you can uh, train your models, but it doesn't stop there. You also need to make sure that once you are in the deployment phase, that you can have a constant flow of this data. You cannot have data that is manually collected um, once you go live. So there's also an automation part to uh, our job. <clears throat> and then the big one, uh, the big part is the deployment. So deployment uh, goes from building perhaps an application that uh, uh, is going to make your models usable by somebody who is not an AI scientist. Most likely the person that is going to use your models is not an AI scientist. So it needs to be packaged in a user-friendly way. Um, and then, of course, we need to monitor our models, uh, make sure that the performance doesn't decline over time. Uh, and I gave the example of the chatbot. So, uh, over time, like now, it's a very strange time uh, with the pandemic. So we're constantly monitoring uh, the questions that clients are, are asking and providing new answers <clears throat> to those new questions. Uh, another example is with the mortgage rate approval project. Um, uh, it's a model that depends a lot on uh, economic variables because we're talking about interest rates, which evolve a lot uh, depending on the economy. And so it's important that we constantly monitor those models because the, the situation evolves over time. So that concludes it for me. Any questions? With a uh, situation like uh, you know the COVID uh, virus, um, AI models. So we hear that AI models uh, might be acting weird. So they are predicting based on the past, and nothing like that happened in the past. Uh, is this something that you see in the bank industry? Is this something that impacts uh, your industry? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, it's, uh, it, that's why the deployment phase, uh, I'm going to go back to this slide. So that's why the deployment phase with uh, performance monitoring is so important. Um, what we, we did prior to deploying the models for the mortgage rate project, uh, we ran simulations to see how the model would behave um, once it's live. And what we do see is that when the, uh, the economy is fluctuating, uh, it has an effect on the performance, but there is ways in which you can mitigate that. And uh, one of the ways uh, we found for this particular uh, type of model for the mortgage rate uh, approval models uh, is that if you constantly retrain them, uh, they don't go obsolete as much. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, but it's, uh, it, it, it's important to constantly monitor them. And for the chatbot, it's the same thing. You know, if, uh, if we don't look at the logs and, uh, and see what the clients are asking us, then it, they're going to go obsolete. Thank you much, Marev. That was uh, very informative. Um, I um, had one question, which is uh, when you're moving to deployment, um, is there um, essentially, um, uh, what's the process of moving from the lab to the deployment? Um, and how do you maintain the project after it's already in deployment? So at the bank, um, well, that's why the, the AI role is so multifaceted because we touch about, we, we touch every phase of the project. We have at the bank what we call, 
sorry about that. We have what we call uh, asset owners. So once we're ready to deploy a model, there's a, a team uh, uh, that is going to take charge um, of uh, deploying it and making sure that uh, nothing goes wrong. Um, so one of the areas that I want to focus on is our experience with um, taking our uh, AI's uh, software as a service platform and uh, moving it to microserver architectures. Um, so I'm uh, the CTO of Knowit, and we essentially uh, provide a service for real-time media monitoring. Um, the system is um, currently um, based on the cloud. And we have been going through a process of migrating it to essentially um, hosted services. And there's been some advantages to this. Um, before I get to that, I'll talk a little bit about um, a typical day or a typical project that we go through. So industrial AI is um, a bit of a funny beast. It's not really a science, even though we do a lot of science. And it's not really an art even though it's very expressive and creative. It's a bit more of a craft where you're trying to get useful stuff out using creative abilities and uh, your understanding of the science. And this is the six step process that seems to show up over and over again. So the first step is always trying to figure out what is it that you're trying to do. You know, you orient yourself, you try and figure out what is the reason why we are um, starting this project. You gather the initial data, examine it, put in the pot, stew it a bit, see what shows up. The next step after that is you have a hypothesis uh, that you know we can actually automate uh, some of the tasks that were either being done by hand or were just impossible with the current set of resources. Um, that involves a traditional um, academic type of uh, endeavor, so feature engineering, the identifying of outliers, thresholding, normalization, just making sure the data behaves and is uh, the type that you need to be working with. Then we um, create the three uh, data sets, the one for development, for testing, and validation. And in some cases, we also have to anonymize because we're dealing with real life data. These are not prepackaged repositories. Um, a very important part at this point is trying to figure out an objective metric by which we can say that the system is working or not. And then we implement and we start getting our initial results. The next phase after that is we've got results, but we've got to make it more useful for real life. We'll find that there are some edge cases um, where it's like the data is sparse or it's in a certain format. We might be able to find um, ways by which we can enrich our data set or our, uh, um, our uh, processing through third party external data or other uh, sources of truth. And we refine the features, features to make sure that the system is performing better, the accuracy is improved. Now the bird is about to leave the nest. So we verify it, make sure we go through our checklist, uh, actually take some real life data and make sure that uh, when we run it through the system, we are getting real results that are useful for us. At this point, we are in a position where we've got the prototype, it has been verified, it works, it has is valuable, but it's not creating value for the company yet. So we're going to be changing that by putting it into production. Uh, when our system goes into production, there is a whole set of activities that are not the ones that um, most AI practitioners focus on. Because you're working on having things work at scale. You're having things, um, you want the results uh, immediately or very quickly. You want it to be reliable. You want it to be robust. So there is a whole bunch of industrial processes at this point involved with multi-threading so that you can use the cores better, using persistence and um, uh, speeding things up by having indexes, uh, caching, um, distributing the system over multiple uh, components just so that you know it's more scalable and uh, it's more predictable in its operations. Uh, you also want to um, come up with uh, mechanisms by which you can uh, support the longitudinal processing because as the system runs over time, you start getting logs from customers, you start getting data over time, and you can use that for another meta level of analysis to improve the results. Um, 
And finally, the area which we're focusing on is that you to structure it in a modern architecture. And the one that has worked really well for us recently is by taking our AI capabilities and packaging them in the form of microservices of using modern containerization and data partitioning. At this point, the system is being used, hopefully by millions of people. And then the problem that we come across is that we learned the system six months ago and the world has changed. Uh, there are new system uh, issue, realities out there, things like, for example, the COVID-19 pandemic, and our concepts are out of date. The vocabulary that our system has learned is different from the nar narratives that are more pop popular and encountered in real life. So we are dealing with concept drift or the concept decay. Um, the only solution to that is uh, essentially relearning the models, and that can be done either in one shot as a batch process, or it can be done incrementally, and there are different, uh, there are different um, strategies available for that. So I'll focus on uh, the last aspect where uh, we were uh, moving into the mi micro um, services architecture. We basically came out of uh, the, the labs, right? And our system, we initially developed it um, on the cloud after it got off the server in my basement. And over about eight years, it um, grew into a behemoth, almost essentially a commodity supercomputer running over 70 different cloud instances. Um, it got to the point where the, just the complexity of the system and the distributed nature of it was such that uh, uptime was hard and you're spending on some given weeks more time dealing with the maintenance of the system than we were actually dealing with the improvement, improving the accuracy, improving the performance, improving the new, adding new features and so on. Um, we had over the years cobbled scripts that would identify whenever uh, parts of the system uh, we're running out of resources, restart the system of particular modules, uh, do self-healing. Um, but it was stuff that was um, spotty. Some areas had it really well put together. Other areas uh, were not so good. Um, and there were opportunities available for auto-scaling, um, for uh, being able to break our vendor um, lock-in, and for essentially having a scenario where even though we built our system for the cloud, we could have parts of it operating on premise with our customers. That came out of our transition to microservices. Microservices have certain characteristics that are very appealing. Uh, one is that uh, they're decoupled. Um, essentially, you have different parts of the system working independently with its own logic and its own data. So you can have developer teams working on a given system without having to worry about the impact on other related systems that uh, are uh, part of the platform. It's much easier to maintain whatever system you can build on your uh, laptop, especially if you use modern containerization, is exactly the same, which will be used on uh, the staging server as well. The life cycle of automation becomes much easier. And the uh, isolation um, allows uh, you to protect yourself from uh, security issues, from resource starvation, and the other uh, hazards of uh, having our uh, comp computer um, platforms running essentially in the real uh, life on, on the web and in the cloud. So this is a quick uh, view graph. And uh, you'll notice that uh, we started out with a monolithic system with the dev team working essentially on, on one big code base. Um, over time, we have broken things out. We have different um, teams working on different parts of the, uh, the problem. Some are working on uh, the geotagging. Others are working on time stamping. Others are working on crawlers and so on. Uh, front end is always was one of the easiest things to move out. But by moving to um, microservices, what we have done is we have allowed the teams to ind independently work on uh, essentially smaller modules in such a way that uh, they do not impact others and the other teams do not need to worry about the code changes or the data changes that uh, are being uh, made by a given team. Um, this be, there's been uh, some other uh, benefits to this uh, process as well. Our legacy cloud infrastructure
structure had, uh, as we see over here, 70 instances. Uh, there were about 280 virtual CPUs and half a byte of RAM running our system. Our data uh, persistence layer was a bit not as much as like half bytes of SSD, three and a half terabytes. By moving a hosted uh, solution, what we have done is that we have reduced everything down to two servers, but we have still maintained the modularized uh, capabilities that we had earlier. So we using containers essentially to run individual modules that are co-located um, in uh, two servers. Um, these two servers have 32 CPUs, uh, half a terabyte of uh, uh, RAM, um, two terabytes of SSD, and eight terabytes of mechanical. Uh, the advantages, there are some direct ones. One is that we are paying about 16% of the amount for the same servers that we are doing with, with the cloud, um, which means that there's a lot more scope for scalability without worrying about costs. Uh, we have 10 times the SSD storage, three times mechanical. Our system is running 10 times faster because one of the issues that we had with the fragmented cloud instances is that almost every one of them had to be over-provisioned. Individually, a given cloud instance had to have almost twice the memory, twice the threads, um, more data, um, more hard drive space than was required, just in case there were spikes in activity. By consolidating everything down to um, essentially two servers, that uh, overhead um, or that room for the peak processing has uh, now been able to be spread out over multiple systems. And uh, the latency is a lot lower. We have things working essentially in the same data center on the same machines in many cases. So it's allowed our um, throughput, the number of uh, data that we, uh, documents that we are processing essentially to be 10 times as much. Our archives have gone up from a month to a year. Um, and uh, we have managed to harden our um, system. So we have had many cases where individual cloud components, uh, as they were exposed on the web, were being hacked and used for cryptocurrency mining and so on. Now everything has gone into a private uh, network, and we have uh, API-mediated access. We've got firewalls. We've got only the basic um, um, aspects uh, visible, and most of the, the fleet and the ship is essentially behind the firewall and is not accessible from the web. Um, and if something is compromised uh, with a single script, we can run it and we can basically switch back to the factory default settings, which means that you know we uh, we can very quickly uh, repair uh, situations where the, there's data corruptions or it's uh, compromised. Um, same with uh, upgrading certain elements. It's essentially just a couple of scripts that need to be changed. And then we kill the original container and push up a new one. And that has allowed our maintenance to be a, a, a lot uh, simpler. The bottom line is uh, I can focus completely and my team can focus completely on improving the system. And we don't have the maintenance headaches that uh, would throw off our development where we spend half a day trying to figure out like what data hot point has boiled over or uh, which part of the system is uh, broken down. All that stuff is taken care of by essentially having built into the fabric. Uh, thank you, Shazam. It's very interesting. So um, you you mentioned that uh, you were struggling with uh, uh, you know spending a lot of time on maintenance. So my question is, um, well, how long it took you to go back to spending less time on maintenance, and uh, what were the key steps that you had to take to to get back to this situation? That's an excellent question. The actual decision to um, switch over to microservices took about a month. Um, we uh, looked into our system. We realized that it was already modular, and uh, it was possible to migrate this over. The, in terms of choosing the technologies, Docker and Kubernetes are industry standard. They've become very popular over the past couple of years. So within a month, we had decided that we're going to uh, migrate our system from cloud to containers. Um, however, it took uh, eight months in total to actually do the migration because uh, our entire uh, system was uh, built on the basis of um, recipes that we had in a Dropbox file, where we had a number of readme scripts and 
you know, step-by-step -step instructions about how to set up libraries and put the code in and set up the right databases and discover stuff and so on. And those all had to be uh, migrated to uh, YAML scripts, which essentially how uh, Kubernetes works. And we had to create the right containers for them. So it was a process by which we had to approach each of the modules individually. And then our code had to be changed because uh, internally we are using uh, IP addresses and ports uh, that were available on the, on the web, on, on the internet. And we had to change them essentially to a private networking. Um, even the data layer, the persistence, there were a number of um, modules that had to be either consolidated into a central data lakes or which had to be uh, partitioned. So they were available locally within a um, given container. So the, the idea of switching over took a, a, a month. The actual process took about um, seven more months to um, deploy. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I wanted you to go back to that slide. I, I really like that slide. It's full of very interesting uh, insights. Uh, I'm wondering, when you say real-world data operation, um, do you mean here that you mostly work on uh, sample data for the first few steps and you introduce the real data later in the pipeline? That's uh, essentially the only way to um, make these problems tractable because um, what you want to do is you want to in increase the cycles of learning. And if you try and work with essentially, um, you know, production ready data equivalents, like massive databases with billions of records and so on, uh, it might take hours or days or weeks sometimes to process that data. So what I find works really well is if you take a slice of it, a representative slice or a sample, and you really kind of like, you know, clean it up, make sure that it is something that is almost like an ideal, and I'll put that in air quotes, uh, set of data. And then you work on um, implementing your um, your system on that. Now, you're you have dealing with a trade-off over here because you're speeding up your learning, you're finding out what works, what doesn't. Very quickly, you identify the noise in this data. You find out the gaps. You find out, like, you know, where is the real juice that you want to squeeze out. Um, but the downside of it is that you're still dealing with a sample. And there's a lot of the real life uh, complexity, which has essentially been ironed out or excluded, which is why you need to have the refinement and the verification steps. Uh, it's I think of it almost like an incubator, where you have a safe place for a, a little uh, baby chicken and then you got to keep it warm and you know you know with the right light and lots of um, um kind of like you know care you take it through the point where it matures but then it has to go through a hardening phase before you throw it in the yard with the other chickens and the roosters and it's uh, contending for resources and proving itself right Uh, hi, my name is uh, Isuru Gunasekara. Uh, I'm from Immersive Data Labs. Uh, today I'll be talking about uh, how to reduce hidden technical debt in machine learning deployments. Um, before we go into the presentation, I'll give a brief introduction of uh, who we are and uh, what we do as a company. Uh, we are a venture-backed machine learning research lab. We are located in Ottawa and uh, most of our clients are Canadian and the US governments, and our projects involve building uh, custom machine learning projects uh, to uh, our um, clients. And uh, this is our team. Uh, we have uh, six machine learning engineers and uh, three uh, front end, um, back end, and uh, full stack uh, engineers, and uh, uh, administration and uh, support uh, staff. Um, so I'll quickly jump into my presentation. So it's about reducing the hidden technical debt in uh, machine learning deployments. So before we go there, um, this is the agenda I have for today. Uh, first, I'll uh, introduce where the hidden technical uh, debt is and uh, how we can uh, then I go into how we can reduce the technical debt by using uh, common method methodologies used in other um, 
practices within the software engineering industry. Um, so first I'll go to where the hidden technical debt uh, is. Uh, as I started my career as a machine learning engineer, one of the biggest uh, challenges as I saw within uh, the industry was uh, deploying machine learning models effectively. Uh, so after a uh, machine learning researcher builds their model, it takes a lot more effort to actually bring it to a level of deployment to have a continuous delivery for their applications. So today, during this presentation, I'll talk about uh, one aspect of uh, this pipeline where uh, delivery happens uh, on the machine on machine learning models. Um, so I'll focus mainly on how to reduce technical debt uh, during deployments. Um, so one of the main reasons why there's technical debt is uh, it's uh, hard to figure out dependencies when it comes to deploying a machine learning models and uh, where to run the model. Uh, and some models require GPU. So after a machine learning researcher builds their model and gives you a trained model, it's usually hard to figure out uh, what are the dependencies are because most of the time those uh, dependencies are not tracked uh, properly. Um, that's one of the main reasons is uh, we as machine learning engineers come from uh, very heavy research backgrounds and our research usually doesn't uh, involve uh, keeping track of uh, dependencies or continuous delivery which is usually required in a, a commercial setting. Um, so this presentation will mostly focus on what to do uh, and less on how to do it. Uh, I'll include links to like where you can get uh, more information about uh, the technologies I'm uh, presenting today. So one of the core things I'm presenting is uh, containerization. Uh, so containerization is uh, making a machine learning model into a independent unit that can be run on top of any OS uh, that supports a container runtime. Um, so this enables portability, faster software delivery cycles, easy reproducibility, and uh, easy scalability. So once your model is within a container that has all the dependencies defined within it, it's very easy to deploy it anywhere uh, on the cloud, hybrid, or on-premise uh, deployments. Um, so one of the challenges uh, you would usually get uh, when developing from within containers is a container by definition is uh, isolated. So, uh, but the problem is we need to actually connect to the running container to do development. Uh, and uh, machine learning engineers, machine learning researchers usually work on uh, Jupyter notebooks. Um, so how you connect to a Jupyter notebook within a container uh, is important uh, so that you can actually do your development or even if you're working on multiple uh, uh, scripts or um, uh, files you have to be able to edit those files easily and uh, the other problem is gpu support uh, within a container you can add the gpu support easily by using tools such as nvidia docker and this also allows uh, easy uh, reproducibility by handling all the um, CUDA or CUDNN requirements within your container instead of uh, having the uh, engineer deploying the model handle them uh, within the OS itself. Uh, so I'll quickly go to an example setup. Um, so in here I have a um, machine learning, uh, uh, I have a Docker container running and uh, I'm connected to it uh, through uh, VS Code, through a plugin called uh, uh, Remote Containers. And uh, you can edit or like, change your uh, files and do your predictions uh, within the container in the same way that you do uh, uh, deployments, deployment. And you can also connect to a Jupyter notebook uh, with, from within the deployment. I, um, I won't have time today to go into how to do this, but uh, it's just a matter of uh, forwarding the correct ports and then starting the Jupyter notebook within your uh, Docker uh, image. Um, so 
Next, I'll focus on how these modules can be deployed after they are containerized. Uh, there are many methods of doing this. I'll cover two methods uh, during this presentation. I'll first go through a simple flask app. This is something anyone can learn within like 10 minutes or so. Then I'll also go into Selden Serving, which is a, a toolkit to deploy machine learning models in production. Uh, so with Flask, uh, it's very it's as easy as a, a Hello World application. You can just uh, deploy your inference model in production just by creating a REST API. Um, you would just need a predict function and a, a function to handle the uh, requests, uh, along with uh, loading the model within your container. Next, I'll introduce Kubernetes. So once you have your models uh, containerized, Kubernetes is an open source system for automating uh, deployment, scaling, and uh, management of containerized applications. Um, uh, so what happens here is uh, you package your uh, code into a uh, container image, and then you deploy it within a node. A node is essentially a virtual machine. So let's say you have 100 uh, virtual machines in your cluster. You can have uh, 100 or 500 different models running on each node uh, based on your requirement. And each of them can communicate with between each other using Kubernetes. And uh, this gives you virtually unlimited scale. So you're only limited by the number of machines you have. Uh, it also gives you flexibility to grow or shrink on demand. You can quickly power up or down a new machine because all of your uh, dependencies are packaged within your container itself. Adding a new machine doesn't require you to configure the machine itself. It's just a, another Linux instance that runs your container. And it can run on-premise, hybrid, or public cloud infrastructure. Um, so for example, if you have some sensitive data that you have to uh, process on the edge, you can uh, have a node running on the edge connected to your cloud that only gets the metadata or the data that uh, is not sensitive outside of the class, uh, outside of your sensitive node. Um, I'll quickly go into Selden Serving. So Selden Core is an open source platform to deploy machine learning models on Kubernetes at massive scale. Uh, so essentially, what uh, on a high level, Selden what Selden Core does is it converts your machine learning models. Uh, or language wrappers into production REST gRPC microservices. And uh, it has uh, features for uh, feature transformation, model serving, then uh, features to handle all steps of your uh, deployment, such as connecting to databases or handling your data sets. So this is a uh, uh, template for packaging a Python model for Selden Co. It's as easy as uh, defining a predict function and an init function where you uh, uh, load in the init function, you would load your model weights. Uh, it can be any, um, it can use any library because you can package all of your dependencies within your container. You can use TensorFlow, PyTorch, uh, Keras. Scikit-learn, it doesn't really matter because all of the dependencies are within your container. Um, and then you just run a predict function, and Selden Core itself deploys your machine learning model and manages it. Um, the next step after you define that file is to package your requirements and uh, define the other core parameters um, and create a Docker file. There's also other tools such as uh, source to image, um, by OpenShift, where you can uh, create an um, image using your source uh, if you don't like creating Docker files. Uh, I've added a link to it uh, on my references. So I'll quickly go through what's next and what's not covered within this presentation. Uh, you can use tools such as uh, Jenkins or Jenkins X, Jenkins X to implement uh, CI, implement your CI CD pipeline for machine learning models. And many of the cloud service providers have very detailed uh, tutorials for this. I've included some in the presentation. And uh, the, another thing is uh, unit testing for machine learning models. Uh, this can be done in ways such as shape tests, comparisons between train steps, 
equality within a tolerance for model outputs. Uh, so one of the things about machine learning models is you can't always have a deterministic output to a given input. So that's why you have to come up with creative ways to actually test your models in production. Uh, so I have uh, included some links you can refer to for that. These are the references for it. And uh, I leave it to you to ask any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so um, that's a really cool uh, presentation. Uh, very technical. And um, I had a question about uh, the testing. Mm -hmm. because, um, in machine learning, a lot of times we care about uh, the reproducibility of our models. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we may incorporate a new feature into our pipeline mm -hmm. if we improve our model, but mm -hmm. we have to update a lot of the code. Um, how do you test for reproducibility in a model? Um, so for example, it could be something like um, if you get the same results when you give the inputs uh, in your uh, model itself. So what uh, containerization and isolating your uh, model within a reproducible environment is uh, one of the advantages of that is you can test just the inputs and outputs without uh, uh, thinking about any of the other requirements in running your model itself. Because if you don't have your dependencies mapped together, someone else can uh, cannot actually run your model on their data sets uh, without having to go through a lot of steps to set up the environment, set up everything else in the same way as your test environment. So I had a question. Um, it looks like you're basically wrapping your models uh, in a bunch of um, like domain uh, agnostic uh, tools. Does that introduce any uh, like additional overhead for for computations if say like inference time or or latency are really important? Yeah, that's uh, that's a very interesting question. One of the advantages of uh, containers uh, instead of uh, having full blown virtual machines is containers are uh, you can uh, think of it in a like in a very simple sense. Con a container is just a uh, part of your hard disk uh, dedicated to your model. It doesn't necessarily involve uh, all of the other requirements for a VM, such as you don't actually have to run an OS on top. Um, it's much more simpler than that. So within a container, we don't see a lot of um, like drawbacks, like a lot, lot of impact in terms of computations. And uh, one of the other advantages is because your model is containerized, you can actually, instead of having just one contain uh, one container, you can have multiple containers very easily if you need like uh, faster response times for multiple requests. Um, and in terms of the effect on uh, compute time, from what we've seen, it's very minimal. It's like neg negligible. So thank you. So I'm going to be talking about some of the cool AI problems that we're solving at Geotech. We're building AI solutions for the concrete industry. And kind of like Siri or Alexa, we call our AI projects uh, Roxy, because rocks are one of the most important ingredients in concrete. So a little overview on us. Uh, we're from Ottawa, and we're a world leader in developing and supplying IoT sensors for the concrete industry. Our flagship product is called the Smart Rock, the sensor that you see in the picture. And you basically uh, tie it onto rebar, which is the formwork of concrete. You pour concrete over it, and it measures properties like temperature or the strength of concrete. And you can view the data on our Smart Rock app. Uh, we were named by the Globe and Mail as one of Canada's fastest growing companies. And last year, we were the fastest in Ottawa. So here's a little map that shows where our sensors are being deployed. They're being deployed uh, all over the world. We have over 7,000 active monthly users, and we're in construction projects across 80 different countries. So this is a lot of data. And two years ago, we started looking into how we can leverage AI to uh, use this data. 
and our first AI project was about uh, concrete pouring time prediction. So on construction sites, you'll usually see the workers uh, pouring their concrete to make a building or a parking lot or whatever they're building. And we wanted to use our temperature data to predict when is the right time to pour concrete. And knowing the exact pouring time can help you um, make critical decisions. So for example, uh, the strength of concrete is a function of the time. So if you know what time you poured, you can accurately calculate the strength. And we collaborated with Mila, which is the Montreal Institute for Learning Algorithms, one of the biggest research institutes in the world for machine learning. And we developed a model that could predict the pouring time. So to build our model, we collected temperature profiles from over 17,000 of our sensors. And uh, the nice thing is that our users uh, usually label the pouring times for us. So our data is labeled. And a temperature profile uh, looks like this figure on the left. Uh, we have temperature readings over time. And the user would just mark where they uh, poured their concrete. Uh, with Mila's help, we trained a convolutional neural network uh, to predict the pouring times from the temperature profiles. So it would basically uh, look at windows of a temperature profile and use the training data to predict when the right pouring time was. And we deployed an app on our SmartRock uh, uh, app to suggest new pouring times. Uh, so if a user uh, selected an incorrect pouring time, like this red line. And uh, we would run our model. And if it disagrees, it would let the user know and let them review the changes. So in this case, the user selected the red line, which is incorrect. Our model predicted the green line, which is the correct pouring time. And they could correct it and get more accurate uh, uh, predictions. So that was our first AI project. Uh, last year, we started our second AI project, which is all about mix verification. So concrete producers need their concrete to reach uh, performance targets, like it has to be uh, a certain strength. But the strength depends on many different factors, including the concrete's recipe. Um, the main ingredients in concrete are cement, gravel, sand, and water. But there's also extra things you can add, like supplementary cementitious materials and lots of different types of chemical admixtures that can make your concrete fancier. Um, but the problem is that testing strength can be expensive and time consuming. So the way you would usually test it is uh, you would make a bunch of samples from your recipe. You would put the samples into a compression machine which basically breaks the concrete and measures how much pressure you need to break it. And we define that pressure as the strength of the concrete. Um, so at the end, you end up with uh, destroyed concrete and it's expensive and time consuming. Uh, so we wanted a more efficient way to predict concrete strength. And so again, we collaborated with Mila to build a strength prediction model. Um, one of the challenges is that there isn't a lot of concrete strength data in the literature. It's not a very well-studied problem. Um, so we have to collect our data from five concrete producers shown here. Uh, these producers really believe in our product and they want to help our models. And uh, with their data, we were able to make a data set that's 160 times bigger than the biggest published data set. Uh, we trained a deep learning model to predict the strength of concrete from its recipe. And currently, we're taking uh, 15 ingredients in the recipe, so it's pretty uh, user friendly. And we deployed an app on our web platform that uses the model to detect possible errors in recipes and strength test results. So now I'm going to do a quick demo of uh, the mix verification. So here we have uh, Geotech 360, which is our web platform where users can manage their projects, look at their sensor data, and add their recipes and strength test results. So I'll do a quick uh, demo to show how the, the model actually works. 
So when you want to add a recipe, you have to add the strength test results first. So uh, here, I'm basically saying that on day one, the strength of our concrete was 10 MPA. MPA is a unit of pressure. And on day three, it achieved a strength of 30 MPA. The next step is to specify your concrete recipe. So here I'm saying that we used 350 kilograms of cement, 250 kilograms of water, 800 kilograms of fine aggregate, which is sand, and 900 kilograms of coarse aggregate, which is gravel. And if the user wants, they can add more uh, different types of ingredients to make it fancier. But for now, we'll just stick with a, a simple recipe. Once you click Save, it runs our model on the recipe. It predicts the strength, and it gives us feedback based on its predictions. So here, it's telling us that given this recipe, the entered strength values seem to be too high. So what that means is our model is predicting that re this recipe would probably get uh, less strength than what we reported. So if we want to improve our model, we can go to Edit Mixture Proportions and uh, make it better for our strength results. In this case, I can add cement to it to get 400 kilograms of cement and rerun our model. So now uh, it says your mix is looking good. Roxy found zero issues with your mix. So that means that with this recipe, our model is predicting that it's pretty close to the reported strength results. So there's probably nothing wrong with the mix. And finally, I want to talk about our work in progress. And this is our uh, long-term goal, which is to create eco-friendly concrete. So producers uh, typically use excessive amounts of cement to strengthen their concrete. Uh, we just saw in the demo that adding cement made our concrete stronger. Um, but the problem is that cement production is bad for the environment. It accounts for 8% of the world's CO2 emissions. So in the figure here, we can see the cement production um, or the CO2 emissions from cement production over the years. And as we make more and more buildings, we produce more and more CO2. Um, one of our goals is to make optimization algorithms that can help producers make more uh, eco-friendly concrete. So this means the concrete has to reach its performance targets, but minimize the amount of cement in the recipe. And cement can be expensive, so minimizing it can also reduce costs at the same time. And finally, uh, I just want to thank uh, everyone at the company for uh, all their effort. Pretty much everyone was involved in the Roxy, the Roxy project in some way. Um, and we have our R&D team here uh, who work directly with the model. We have uh, concrete experts, and their expertise is really useful when we're uh, developing models. Uh, we have data scientists who are really helping us uh, improve our models. And uh, since we get our data from uh, producers, uh, there's a lot of data extraction and cleaning that's involved before we ever uh, go into the machine learning aspect. So we have uh, great co-op students who work hard so in your second uh, AI project, it looked like you were using a concrete recipe to try and predict uh, specifications about the concrete, such as strength. Uh, given that you have that, that type of data, do you, uh, are you also able to do the prediction in the other way, where, say, you want have a desired strength and you want to predict what the concrete recipe is going to be? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, it touches on our work in progress. Um, so our long-term goal was to uh, make eco-friendly concrete. And we want recipes that can minimize CO2 and cost, but we also wanted to reach the performance targets like strength and uh, other performance metrics. So we're working on uh, optimization algorithms that could uh, accomplish this. Um, it's a pretty challenging problem because there's so many uh, ingredients. Um, you have to worry about lots of constraints on how you make the concrete, certain ratios between ingredients, and then constraints on the performance metrics themselves. And it's a really huge um, uh, search space. So um, it's a pretty difficult problem, but there is some literature on uh, optimizing recipes. And we're looking at different uh, optimization techniques to uh, 
really solve this problem. Um, in terms of your uh, the first product where you have a sensor that uh, goes into the concrete, um, is there a way to uh, connect that to your second product, or like, uh, is it always uh, like do you always measure the strength after the uh, pouring? Is there a way to know like uh, the ideal uh, time uh, before pouring, like uh, when to pour? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so right now it's sort of um, tied to our first product uh, because in our Geotech 360 platform we do have uh, the temperature data and we are using it to calculate strength. Um, the our second AI project, which was the model, uh, it basically uh, predicts the strength before and so uh, it should really be used before. Um, you're making the concrete, but um, they are sort of related. So hi, I'm uh, Nolan Wincher, a senior autonomy developer on the perception team here at Auto Motors, and I'm going to talk to you about some AI challenges of self-driving industrial vehicles. So a little bit about us. Uh, we make autonomous uh, self-driving industrial vehicles uh, for material handling. Uh, we have vehicles in multiple different weight classes. So on the left uh, image here, you'll see uh, our larger robot that handles payloads up to 1,500 kilograms. And then on the right, you'll see a smaller uh, robot that handles payloads up to 100 kilograms. Uh, in addition to these uh, two platforms, we also develop a fleet management software that uh, coordinates the work to be done by uh, the vehicles in the facility, as well as acts as the primary uh, interface for uh, our customers. So autonomous material handling is pretty much exactly what it sounds like. Uh, that's carrying goods from one place to another. Uh, this is usually in an industrial facility, so things like manufacturing plants or packaging facilities or distribution centers, uh, that type of thing. Uh, the vehicle itself is the autonomous mobile base that you'll see across these images, um, but those will usually get paired with some sort of attachment to interface with the facility itself. Uh, so that could be a lift for pickup and drop-off stands or a conveyor belt for uh, interfacing directly with uh, existing infrastructure, uh, or if the loading and unloading is more manual at that facility, it might be something simpler like uh, just a, a shelf of some kind. So self-driving industrial vehicles, uh, as you might expect, use similar, te similar technology to autonomous cars, um, except that we operate in indoor settings, which means uh, a lot of the techniques we use have to be a bit different. Uh, so for example, we can't use GPS since we're indoors, uh, uh, as well as the general just driving um, rules are very different. So there's not necessarily uh, proper signs anywhere. There's no intersection lights. There's no lane markings. Um, there's also uh, no, not necessarily a separate area where people versus vehicles operate. So uh, we tend to operate really close to uh, humans within facilities. Uh, and for that reason, safety is very critical to our operations. But uh, given the, the way our vehicles work, there's also no safety drivers. Um, so autonomous industrial vehicles are actually already a thing that are already in market, uh, and in our case, uh, they've driven over 650,000 kilometers uh, just in the last year, uh, fully autonomously. So AI at auto is what you might expect if you're familiar with autonomous mobile robots. Uh, incorporates lots of different AI technologies across lots of different uh, aspects. Uh, so that includes like planning and navigation to perception, which is object tracking, uh, localization, uh, but also things like traffic management and informatics. Uh, one thing to note here, um, a lot of the AI technologies we utilize in most of these bubbles is more traditional AI and not necessarily more modern machine learning. Um, of course, in, in research and to some extent in industry, uh, more machine learning approaches are making their way into each of these aspects. Um, but for the most part, we still rely heavily on more traditional AI. So machine learning is obviously really powerful and important. Uh, and we find it especially so where it's really difficult to apply more traditional AI methods. Uh, so that can be in cases where uh, a more traditional algorithm is just difficult to configure ahead of time. 
Uh, so say we don't want to have to be retuning parameters every time we deploy or every time a situation changes. Uh, and then it's also uh, really useful to use machine learning where the task itself is just difficult to reason about or model, which is generally the case with things like computer vision or uh, classification. Uh, now it's important to note, because a lot of the more uh, modern machine learning uh, methods, uh, such as deep learning, tend to be uh, sort of seen as black boxes, we need to be really careful about how we apply them uh, because of the safety critical nature of our operation, um, because we need to make sure that um, we don't introduce any unpredictable behaviors into the robot or things that we can't uh, understand um, in new environments. So applying machine learning for us, uh, we usually start by doing literature review, uh, taking a look at whatever the state of the art uh, algorithms out there are. And if we find things that we like that solve problems for us, we'll try and adapt those uh, into our own system. Uh, this in itself is really difficult partially because a lot of the um, algorithms out there are both trained and evaluated against public data sets, which are really only good for proof of concept work and don't necessarily indicate how well an algorithm is going to perform in the real world or in a different application. Uh, and obviously, models trained on those types of data may not perform well at all if they're uh, tried to be adapted to some other setting. Um, a lot of the research also focuses on self-driving car research specifically. Uh, which, again, is in a completely different setting that has slightly different challenges. So a lot of those algorithms and the way they're evaluated doesn't necessarily apply to us. Uh, then on top of all that, of course, we need to add in system reliability and robustness that's usually skipped over by resources, uh, researchers, uh, as well as work within the limitations that we have on our specific system, so the robot hardware, for example. So in machine learning specifically, obviously, uh, data challenges are a big thing. Uh, as I was talking about earlier in our specific domain, uh, there aren't really uh, many public data sets available and not that much research has focused there, um, which makes it really challenging because uh, not only are the algorithms not necessarily optimized for our domain, but it's also very difficult just to benchmark them because we don't necessarily have a good standard data set to, to look at. Uh, Building that data set is also really challenging. Uh, a large part of that is because industrial facilities are private property, which means we can't just show up and record whatever we want uh, at any time the way that you might be able to on public roads. Um, and then once you're even with, once you even have that permission, the recording itself can take a lot of resources. So that would be space, but also uh, computational resources if you're, say, doing compression or filtering live, uh, especially if that robot is in operation and not being used specifically for recording. Uh, then, of course, once you have all that data, um, then you start running into other problems, such as sorting and filtering the data down to the data that's really useful for the problem that you're solving uh, and most relevant to it. Um, as well as if you're doing a supervised learning type of task, the data labeling aspect in itself is also surprisingly difficult and much more than you might expect. Uh, even if you're working with data contractors, um, there's a lot of back and forth and a lot of management of uh, with your team and uh, their labeling team to make sure that they're doing everything correctly and they're handling edge cases correctly uh, and all of that type of thing. And it's really not a, like a one-click service where you just hand data and get ground truth back. Uh, so say we get past all of that, and then we'll develop an algorithm. Um, at that time, we start running into what I call runtime challenges. Uh, a lot of these have to do with uh, how robots need to run in real time. Uh, and it's not just that your algorithms need to run in real time. They also need to run in real time alongside lots of other things that also have to run in real time. Uh, so that means you need to be using uh, really light amounts of computation. Uh, so you won't be able to, say, use the entire CPU or GPU. You really only get to have fractions of that. Um, and believe it or not, a lot of uh, industrial facilities have really bad network and Wi-Fi coverage, which means that it's really not practical to try and offload any of this to uh, a server, say. Um, additional to all of that, we also need to make sure that uh, the algorithms uh, even if they work, that they need to be really robust to failure, because obviously these are fully autonomous vehicles. Uh, so if your algorithm fails for whatever reason, we don't want it to do something bad, like go and collide with something. Uh, so we need to be able to determine, uh, 
either you know how to make it not fail or how to identify a failure so that we can handle that in some kind of uh, more clean way. Uh, so here's just an example of uh, a data set that we've been working on, uh, some machine learning work going through the challenges that I discussed. Uh, this is something similar to cityscapes that you might be familiar with. Um, it's basically a fully fully segmented indoor industrial uh, facility. Uh, obviously, all the classes are completely different, so we needed to come up with uh, new classes and new annotation structures, uh, new rules, um, and all kinds of things that are very specific to this type of data. Uh, there's still a lot of work to be done in uh, optimizing the algorithms uh, against it specifically uh, for things like the different shapes of objects involved and the different weightings of different uh, types of classes. Uh, and then obviously we still need to work on utilizing it for more specific features in the robot and to adjust the behaviors of the robot in some kind of intelligent way. Um, but some exciting work I wanted to share. So just to summarize, uh, in case you weren't aware, self-driving industrial, uh, industrial vehicles are here. Uh, we're not uh, years away like some other self-driving technology. Um, I thought it was important to note also that there's, I think, a lot of really interesting R&D works in the specific field of self-driving industrial vehicles uh, that I think are not necessarily the same as, say, self-driving cars. And I think it would be really cool if uh, more research was done focusing on it. Um, and then just for anybody out there who's thinking of becoming an applied uh, machine learning developer of some kind, um, just remember that there's a lot of challenging steps between turning lab results into product features. Um, and it's really a lot more than just having some data and training like a neural network against it or something like that. There's, there's many steps involved uh, and a lot of things are really challenging about that. Uh, and if anybody out there watching found what we're doing exciting, maybe check out a career with us. Uh, and I've got my email there in case anybody wants to reach out uh, for any further questions. Thanks. So uh, that was a great talk. Um, I had a question about your models. I know in computer vision, there's lots of pre-trained models. That um, do you ever use those pre-trained models, or do you have to build your models from scratch? Yep. So for the most part, we build all our models from scratch. Um, we find it's generally better that way for uh, optimizing both the learning process specifically for our tasks, but also optimizing the uh, networks themselves against the hardware that we're using. Uh, sometimes we will still use, uh, you know, like publicly available um, models, mostly just to verify that uh, networks will behave the way we expect uh, before we go and invest the, our own time in developing those models ourselves. In in your algorithms, uh, like I'm guessing um, some of them are mostly like deterministic algorithms. For example, like path planning um, or obstacle avoidance uh, would be deterministic. Uh, how would you incorporate uh, machine learning models uh, alongside uh, these de deterministic algorithms? Like what are the challenges that usually arise when you try to do that? Yeah, so I think a lot of the uh, issues uh, so you're asking specifically about like machine learning in, in the navigation stack. Um, yeah. So in those areas, I think the most important part where uh, I think machine learning could be useful is basically reasoning about uncertainty. Uh, so it's really, it's deterministic largely if you know with high degrees of certainty what your surrounding environment is, um, then it makes sense to know, you know, I need to drive along this path or drive around it like this. But if we're, if we have un any sort of uncertainty about what we're measuring, uh, which right now is kind of difficult to reason about um, in, in a more handcrafted way, I think that's where you start getting uh, really uh, useful behaviors from machine learning, where it can kind of intelligently decide that it's more likely that, say, I should take this path than this other one, because historically that, that tends to work out better based on these types of measurements uh, throughout my data set. Uh, yeah, so I feel like that that's kind of the way that you would do it.